I thought it was such a cool picture, you know, because it, I don't know, to me it kind of sounds like many cultures, you know, different peoples and that kind of thing. Um, and so that was really exciting. That was my first word from God where he, I felt like he was like, you're, gonna, you're gonna, actually going to do this one day. And I was like, cool. So I like really held on to that. And then within that same year, there was like another like two or three confirmations of the exact same thing, um, saying um, people kind of speaking over me, you're going to go to nations. And so, um, yeah, this is something that I've been like sitting on, I guess, for a long time. Like when is this, you know, when does this start to happen? Um, over the years, I, I, I guess I, I was aware that I could go and try and find places that do this and like just like try and make it happen. But I guess I didn't feel like the go in my heart from God to say now's the time. And I started to feel like, you know, one day when I'm married, I think that this is what I want to do with the person who I'm married to. I want to go do this kind of thing with my husband. And so, um, yeah, when I met Aaron, <laughs> the pressure's been on. No, no. Um, <laughs> you know, ever since then, like, we got married in 2016. And ever since then, it's just been kind of like, okay, wow. So, like, I'm in this season now, and I'm like, so when, God? Like, when is it? When does it start? When does it happen? And, you know, you get into the, um, the nine to five rat race of life and you start to feel like, how do I ever break out of this, you know? Once you're living that adult life and you're paying rent and it can feel very, you can start to feel very kind of contained in that. And uh, so I've been asking God, basically, um, when is this going to happen? Is this ever going to happen? <laughs> um, that kind of thing. And, um, but something that was quite a cool piece to the story as well in terms of confirmations, again, about this kind of thing for us was... Um, when me and Aaron had met, we weren't together yet, but he actually had a dream about me. I'll get you to share it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Hello. Oh, we saw that. Um, yeah, no, I was gonna, um, I was gonna say as well. Contextually, for us, uh, when, when we got together, we both uh, left our the homes of our parents, um, and this is like you know the first real relationship, technically. Cl- between the two of us and stuff, and so it was lots of new stuff, and and we're in a new season of, of development and growth and learning, and um and then obviously um now is is a new season. Anyway, uh, the dream that I had prior to um actually connecting with Elodie was uh it was a really really vivid dream, and it was really interesting, uh, and I'll I'll point out later why I think this is interesting. But um in this dream, I it was a very cinematic based view of um I call it cinematic because. I work with cameras and stuff, and um, what I saw was Elodie walking towards what looked like a temple um, on a dirt road, and there were these young children uh, kind of dancing, running around her. Uh, I don't know if, if that makes sense. And, um, and she was wearing a white dress. <laughs> I'm shorter than the seat. <laughs> Be careful. Um, white dress, walking towards a, towards a temple. And I knew it was a temple because there was a collection of gold gods lining the temple, and they were all, like, you know, there was no specifics, but they were, they were obviously of a um, different religious base, and um, she was walking towards it, and then she sort of veered off to the right and went down to a little, like a little gully, prob- a little thing, probably as wide as this room, and right in the middle was a stream, and, uh, and my perspective, um, what I could see went, like, right to her, and she turns to me, she looks directly at what would have been what I could see, and all of a sudden, my view sort of pulled away from her really quite rapidly, and um, a resounding voice said three times, I love you, I love you, I love you, and it was really impacting, uh, and I woke up, I woke up just at, and I checked the time, it was 12 o'clock, and, um, and I was like, whew, <laughs> that was intense, <laughs> here's this girl I'm starting to notice, and then all of a sudden I have this quite intense dream, very vivid, don't normally dream vivid dreams, and um, and so I wake up the next morning, and, and this is part of the significance. I woke up the next morning, and I was living with, um, well, Phil was living with us at the time. And so best friend of mine, married to my sister now, and he, um, I'd had a shower, and I was just loving on Jesus. And I came back into the room, uh, my room, and he had come into my room and sprawled out on my bed. And, uh, and he has, <laughs> we're, we're best friends, don't worry. Um, <laughs> and he, uh, he dreams a lot, and he has a lot of interpretation of dream, and uh, he's seen people in dreams that he's met the next day, and, and stuff like that, people he's never met before, so really cool stuff, and um, and I was like, oh, I had a dream last night, it just came back to me, and uh, and I started sharing the dream, when I got to the part where I said, I love you, I love you, well, what I heard was, I love you, I love you, I love you, uh, I broke down and started crying to him, and I'm like, at the time, I'm like, <laughs> you can imagine, I'm like, in my towel, and he's on my bed, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, sharing a dream with him. It's kind of some crazy stuff, and uh, and he's like, yeah, he's just listening and, and loving on me and trying to engage with God in that moment, um, and I'm like, oh, I just, 
I think God's just showing me his love for her. And I'm like, no. Nah. Anyway, uh, so that was the beginning of something. And I didn't share that with her, just in wisdom. That would have been really weird. Uh, <laughs> but there was a time when that was really appropriate to share with her. And, and that's another story. But um, that was a key piece in terms of our relationship establishment that was there. Um, and Elodie had a bunch of other stuff going on. So that was, that was my part. So, yeah, yeah, I had a couple words about my husband leading up to, like, you know, getting together with Aaron, which were really um, kind of led me to him. And so this was his piece um, of the story was a stream where he saw me in this kind of Asian-looking country, yeah. So that, that, that was that. And then, um, yeah, so fast forward to being married. Um, in that first year of marriage, like, one of, our fir- one of our friends at church, Gordy, I don't know if he's here today, oh, there he is, came over to us, and he's like, I feel like you guys are going somewhere, you guys are going somewhere soon, I can see it, do you guys have a heart for mission, or, or something like that, and, um, and so we talked a little bit about it, and he kind of had this feeling that s- uh, Southeast Asia might be a place that we go, well, oh, yeah, okay, sort of thing, and then um, a little while later, there was another word that really confirmed the idea of that location, Southeast Asia, which was really cool. So we kind of started to feel like, oh, well, wow, now we have a sense of maybe where we're going, which was, you know, as further as we've ever gotten. And it's like, that's exciting. Um, and so, um, yeah, this year, actually, um, just, just chatting with Gordy about the idea of us going and, and he, he was feeling the sense that this is something we need to step into and, like, activate. Um, he said... Um, I've got this friend who um, is involved in missions all over the world and he oversees a lot of stuff and um, he might be a good guy for you guys to just sit down and talk to and talk about missions and hear from him and he might put you off, but (laughs) he's probably a good guy to talk to. (laughs) And so we're like, okay, cool. So so he um, gives him our contact and we we meet up with this guy, his name's Phil, in, um, in a cafe in town, didn't know him. Um, to talk about missions and stuff like that. And this was a really um, divine appointment for us, actually. So, um, yeah, we met up with Phil, and um, when we walked in that day, he had another guy sitting there with him. And um, we didn't know who this other guy was, but he introduced him as Pastor Ronnie. And so, okay, cool, you know, hi. And uh, I kind of just assumed maybe Pastor Ronnie was just hanging out with Phil that day. Um, But when we sat down and I was kind of wondering who's this guy, I felt like Holy Spirit said to me, um, this guy's more significant to you guys um, than you realize right now. And I was going, okay. So I was just sitting with that, you know. And so Phil starts asking us, you know, um, what's your hearts? Have you, guys, have you guys had words about going on mission? Have you guys had dreams about going on mission? And so we shared our words and we shared our dreams. And he, he said, okay, cool. You know, you're called. So that's really important. And, um, yeah, and then, and then, oh, yeah, he asked us about our vocations. And he's like, what do you do? I don't know if you guys know, but I'm a youth coach and a counsellor, so I work for um, the Vibe Hutt Valley Youth Service. And um, Aaron? Yeah, so I, I run a business that does, like, video and photography. Um, we niche in, like, real estate, but we do promotional content. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of media stuff. Yeah, so we shared what we do, and he was like, oh, wow, we actually really need, Ronnie said, I re- we actually really need counsellors um, on the mission field. And it's something that had never actually, um, I hadn't actually crossed my mind which is kind of funny. I was like, oh, he's like, you know, like a bunch of the children that we look after, I mean, they're traumatized sometimes and even sometimes the staff we could really do with some counseling. And um, and then Phil was like, you know, if I really had, if I had a guy like you on my last trip, that would have been awesome, you know, like with the camera and the ability to take photos and document what's happening and what God's doing. Yeah, there was a real, um, there was a real moment in that conversation when he, when he asked about vocation, like, I don't know about, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but thinking about mission and going on mission, if you've ever thought about it, um, in my mind, I was like, what would I do on, would I like go dig a well and like build a house or like, you know, what would I do? And I, I'm not a carpenter, I don't, I'm not a builder, so I don't have those skills. And, uh, and when he asked about my vocation, it was just like, ah, oh, there's value in my current vocation that, that supersedes my understanding right now. And then I realized, like, you think about World Vision, and you realize someone filmed it. Someone went out there and got the content and did that, and that was what brought it back to us, and, and we were able to connect Ality to, to that when, at, at such a young age. And I was like, huh, there's, there's value in the vocation. And the same goes for, for counseling. It's, um, yeah, we can get into that more later. But, yeah, it was, it was just a kind of light bulb moment. Yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. We just never realized we could do what we do, and it would be valuable in this area. So that was really validating for us. We're like, oh, wow, okay, we have something to offer. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and, um, yeah, and then um, what happened next? 
Um, and then he said, um, oh, and then I'm pretty sure he passed it over to Pastor Ronnie. He said, I'll get Ronnie to share, to share his story with you. So we're going to tell you Ronnie's story as well. So this is the other guy sitting there that day. Yeah, so, so Ronnie, um, he gave us a quick brief rundown on his life story, and, uh, and it impacted us significantly. But I'll give you, I'll try to give you a quick brief run on it. Um, so Pastor Ronnie, he's, uh, he's an Australian Dutchman who, um, at, he, he got married quite young, I think he was about 23, uh, and he quite quickly became a Christian after marriage just through seeking, and uh, his wife didn't connect with him in that way, and so they had about eight years of turmoil between the two of them. Um, and after eight years uh, of Ronnie pressing in on love and understanding love and growing, uh, the impact of his life uh, changed his wife's heart, and, um, and she became a Christian, so eight years and then Christian, and then uh, they had about eight to nine months together, um, and at the end of that eight to mu- nine months, his, his wife uh, tragically died in a car accident, and she had the two kids with them, and they both were critically injured, and they were um, in the hospital set to die, basically, uh, and God miraculously healed them, and, um, and so he saw... He saw um, devastating loss and incredible miracles uh, all in sort of a really close proximity in a season in his life. And he realized that, that life can just, just like that, it's gone. And, um, and the severity of life just sort of hit him really, really hard. And so he went on a journey from there, um, quite well established in his job and his role, uh, got remarried about a year and a half after to, to um, yeah, the stories. Uh, and his kids were healthy and all that. And so one day he was out pottering in his garden and, uh, and he, he's just doing his thing. And God says to him, Holy Spirit just speaks to him and says, hey, Ronnie, are you happy? And he's like, just responds. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm happy. I, I have a car and I have a new house and a beautiful wife. And then God says to him again, Ronnie, are you happy? And he goes, yeah, of course I'm happy. I, I have two beautiful kids who have been miraculously healed. I have a great job, a steady income. I have everything conventionally I need. And he said, but Ronnie, are you satisfied? And uh, in that moment, Ronnie was like, he had a conviction and realized that there was more that he could do. And he said, no, God, there's more I can do. There's more I can do for the kingdom and there's more I can do for you. Um, and this, this all ties into that revelation about life, how it's, it can be fleeting and just. And, um, and so he, he felt the urgency to go and he ran to inside and talked to his wife and he said, hey, sit down. Um, oh, sorry. After he said that, Holy Spirit said to him, I want you to pack up self and go. And so he runs inside with this and sits down with his wife. And, uh, and he's like, sit down, sit down, sit down. And he's like, I've just had a conversation with the Holy Spirit. This is what he said. And uh, as soon as he said that, she said, uh, she apparently she went, yay! Ah! And it turns out that she had been sitting on a word about missional-based life uh, since she was a young girl. And this was, she was just resting in this and it's just being um, diligent and, and honoring her husband and his process and obviously her two children adopted. And um, so... That was that was some big stuff. They went to um, they went to Bible college for a year just to prep themselves for the next year, but they sold everything they had, and uh, and then they ended up connecting into Borneo. Um, they initially started on the coastal region, connecting with um, all the churches and doing missional work with uh, another couple who, had with, who were with them, and um, and he asked these people on the coastal regions, all, all the pastors, and I think it was about 100 different churches, he asked them the same question, and he got the same unanimous three, uh, three responses back. He said, why don't you guys go into the jungle? Now, the jungle of Borneo, uh, the picture's not there, but it's, it's huge, you can imagine, uh, and there's about 100 tribes, and uh, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of people in each tribe sort of thing, and so a lot of people who haven't connected with, with the gospel, they've never heard it before, um, untouched, untapped sort of thing. So why don't you bring the gospel to the, to the people? Uh, and contextually, um, all the, like, the tribes are quite primitive. Um, there was headhunting occurring, um, quite animistic. So there's a hierarchy of, of a witch doctor, then a, uh, a tribal chief, and so on. Um, and that was sort of a, yeah, so he got the same three responses. And they were, it's too expensive, it takes too much time, and it's too dangerous. Um, a lot of people going in and getting killed. And, um, and he felt like Holy Spirit was saying that he needs to go to the heart of Borneo jungle, and establish and spread the word, basically. And so it was about nine, I think about nine to ten years later, he, um, he ended up going into a couple of tribes. Um, he was doing it progressively, and he noticed that there was a, a deficit within the tribal people. Um, what would often occur is as young girls um, reach a state of maturity when, when they have their first period, basically, they can be sold. Um, and so they would be sold for a couple of pigs so their family can have income, and they would be sold to an older man, maybe um, you know, in his 50s, and two or three, um, 
two or three hus- uh, wives already, and she would just be another slave and another virgin, basically, to have, um, have yeah. Um, so it's, it's pretty rough. They, these kids from 11 to 20 might have anywhere between four to six children. Um, most of them will die. Most of the kids will just, they have no, um, no infrastructure for that. The father already has two or three wives and doesn't want to have another baby, so the baby is either strong and, and the mother cares for them, or the mother doesn't have the, the mothering skills, the social skills, the, the, any of that to establish their children. And, and so the babies are just dying left, front, and center, everywhere. And he was like, to, to get this cycle to stop, we need to take these, these girls out of this, out of this culture. Um, he was saying there's a lot of kids that just end up fending for themselves out yeah. in the jungle, just kind of running around and, yeah. And so, um, uh, so he ended up adopting eight young girls from tribes at one time. Um, and, and they were quite happy to, to allow their children to leave for the sake of knowing that they'll be fed, cared for, and, and receive education. And they know that within the tribal um, environment, there's no development there. Um, and so these young girls, it, it, he brought in aid, and at the end of the month, he received um, a, mir- a financial miracle where money just came in from nowhere. They don't know where it came from, and, uh, and they had it just enough, not too much, not too little, to, to cover the cost of, of these children. And he basically, he, at that point, he said to God, if you can do it with eight, you can do it with 30. And, um, and so he went and he got 30 kids, and it was him, him his wife, and, uh, and another couple that were caring for these children. And, um, and at the end of the month, the exact same thing happened, more financial um, support. and Just enough came in every time. They didn't know where it came from. Yeah. And so at the end of that month, they said, if you can do 30, you can do 70, and so on. Um, and once, I think they had about, I think he said about 70 kids. Um, the Holy Spirit challenged him and said, Ronnie, I want you to prepare land and a, and a space for 1,000 kids, and I want you to sp- prepare uh, for another 1,000. Um, and so as of today, he has 650 children in his care. Um, they've established uh, a, a massive um, facility around the heart of the jungle, um, and there's obviously plenty of other stories around that, but that's where he's at today, and that's, that's where we're heading into. Yeah, so he said prepare to house a thousand and school two thousand. So another like thousand from the region can come. And so yeah, this is pretty moving to hear his story and just the way he's like laid down his life. He's like, I've got nothing to my name. He's like, but I'm so rich in the kingdom. And it was just really impacting and like, wow. And um and so yeah, after hearing Ronnie's story, um, this guy Phil who was there said, you know, like, I oversee a lot of different places, but I actually think that with Ronnie um, at Living Waters Village in Borneo, that would be a really great place for you guys to start and to get a taste of missions. And um, so this is a little bit of a side story, but when he said Living Waters Village, um, that was a real moment for me because um, when I finished studying, I did my counselling degree, and so there was this year where I was looking for a job and not able to get one. I really wanted to work in counselling, and I was like, what do I do? Do I potentially open up my own private practice and just go for it? And I was thinking about that, and I didn't feel like that was for now, but um, I was reading the Bible one day, and it got to the bit in the Bible where uh, Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman, and he talks about the living waters. And um, the, the words living waters just like jumped off the page at me, and um, and I felt like God, that was the name for my private practice one day. And I didn't feel like it was for now, but I felt like it was for one day. And I felt like God had just given me the name. It was really profound. I was like, Living Waters, that's what I'd call it. It's Living Waters, I don't know, Living Waters Counseling, I don't know. And, um, and I was really excited about this at the time because it was really profound for me. So I shared it with a couple of people. I shared it with Michael and I shared it with Aaron and... Um, and yeah, I was like, God's giving me the name. And I've actually forgotten about this recently because I'm working at the moment and, you know, it's just sort of happening. And so when he said at Living Waters Village, I was like, did you just say Living Waters? And I all kind of came back. And he's like, yeah. And I, I, I turned to Ronnie. I was like, is that the name of your place? And he's like, yeah, it's Living Waters Village. And I was like, whoa, that's so crazy for me. <laughs> and it was just like this moment where the two, like, these two things collided, like um, my my counseling work and what I do and this thing about going on mission they like just came together and I realized like oh my goodness like this could be something that's all tied in and it was just really impacting and um so that was a bit of a moment and really blew my mind um so yeah 
so they, they prayed for us as well and, and um, shared a couple of words. And it was really, really uh, quite a blessed time. Uh, and we ended up leaving and um, Elodie and I walked down the road and we kind of like, we were just sort of in awe of the situation and, and just overwhelmed a little. We both just had a little cry together. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, I ended up taking that back to, to the business, so my, my work, obviously. I worked with my brother, Nick, and, and Phil, he's just at the back there. Um, and it's kind of important, or it makes sense that if, if there's going to be some involvement in mission stuff, that, that it's inevitably going to affect the business. Uh, in, the, in this case, we'll be away for sort of four to five weeks. So um, I just want to let them know how the, how the conversation went and, um, and sort of some ideas around uh, what this could mean for the business. So we, we do um, video work and, and photography and stuff like that. But it'd be, my heart was kind of stirring, and so I shared these ideas around um, the potential of facilitating and, and potentially training people up into a position where they can um, be basically equipped to go and do these sort of things. Um, and so that, that, anyway, those are just ideas that I was throwing around. And so I shared that with Nick, and he took it back to his wife and, um, and shared that with his wife, Polina. And, uh, and Polina ended up messaging Elodie a, a little bit later. Yeah, so this was just like a really cool piece of confirmation for us, like along the way. So we've just sat down with Ronnie. We're like, oh my goodness, we're actually going to go there. God's given us the place to begin. Which on a side note, I've been really asking God, like, I know I could just Google it <laughs> and find some cool places, but I don't actually don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to go and find what I think is a good idea. Like, I want you to connect me to something. I want you to direct me to where you want me to go. And um, so that's like leaving that day, we're like, wow, this, that, that's exactly what he's done. And so that in itself was amazing. But um, yeah, so Polly kind of got back to me like later on in the week and she was like, oh my goodness, like Nick's told me about you guys, you know, potentially going to Borneo and this whole living waters thing. And she's like, that's crazy. And so she reminded me of this word she had for me two years ago. So, and she'd actually sent it to me on Messenger. So she'd gone back two years and found it. <laughs> and um, screen capped it for me and sent it to me so I could like read it again and she said um, she talked about how she was up one night and struggling to sleep and then she kind of went into this vision where she was hearing me speaking to a lady um, but she was hearing me speak in another language and she said um, it wasn't a spiritual language it was a learned language and she said two years ago she said so I really believe that this means that one day you and Aaron will go somewhere where you're going to learn the language of the land and this will be part of your ministry together and I really felt like the language was Indonesian she said that two years ago and I had forgotten about that just because I was like oh you know maybe you know and I, but and they're like this that week after sitting down with Ronnie this comes up and she said it two years ago and like Indonesian is just so specific that blew our minds we were like that's crazy just crazy and you know like with my work that's exactly what it looks like uh, counseling looks like a conversation and if I was doing that over there I'd probably be doing it with the ladies you know um and so yeah just there's little pieces in there that are like just feel so profound for us um yeah so it's really exciting just how God's pieced this together and um and it's like all of a sudden, you know how sometimes you're, you're sitting and you're waiting on something that you know God's put in your heart or he's promised you. And um, it can be a long journey sometimes to the moment where it all starts like unraveling and it's like he just starts opening the gift, you know. It's like starts like pulling off the layers and you get to see what he's been setting up for you all this time and it looked like nothing was happening. Um, I've, I've experienced that a good couple times in my life and it's amazing. And um, I guess, like, part of, part of sharing this with you guys is it, it's, it's so encouraging the way that God really cares about the things that we, we um, desire in life. He really, really cares about the things in our hearts. And um, when they're, like, in line with his heart and in line with his kingdom, he's, um, I think he loves to give us those things. I think he loves to go before us and make it happen. Like, he cares about your dreams, you know? Um, yeah, and it's just so special the way he goes about lining those things up for us. So I don't know, maybe that's for someone who's sitting on some things today um, that you haven't seen yet. God hasn't forgotten. I feel like he wants you to know he hasn't forgotten. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say as well, um, 
So this is obviously uh, round one for us, and I think it'll be one of many, but um, this is the beginning of a, of a story and uh, beginning of a journey, but we really want to connect with you guys. And so uh, obviously as I'm going to be doing film and, and photography, I will, we're pretty remote, so we won't be doing much update, but there will be stuff hopefully to come um, that, that we can share with you guys. But the other thing is, um, I don't know, it's, I, it's something that Phil said to us in our um, meeting with him. He said, don't go for two weeks. Just don't, don't just come and go for a short period of time. Go and build some relationship with the people and, and get a real, real feeling for what it means to be engaging with another culture, with another group of people, and, um, and invest yourself in that. And uh, so for us, this isn't just a um, you know, fulfillment of a good idea. This is, we believe, the beginning of a journey, um, both with Awaken as connected um, to where we're going and, and with us in general, but also for us to hopefully bridge some relationship with um, groups of people as we progress and develop. And, uh, and I really hope that Living Waters is going to be the first step in that, in that process. And um, I really look forward to, to what God has to, to, to bring there. Yeah. Cool. How are we doing for time? Good. Awesome. Hey, we're going um, to play a quick video, if that's okay. We've got a little bit extra time there. Um, and this, this video was produced actually this year uh, for Living Waters, so you guys can get a feel for where we're going. Um, and it was really, really great production quality, and um, I think they had a group of people over there um, basically doing uh, probably some of the stuff that hopefully that I'd be able to do. Um, yeah, let's, let's fire it up. Oh, the audio's a little bit hard to hear. Just bear with it. G'day, my name is Ronnie Haybour, and uh, me and my wife and children, we came here 24 years ago to this place here in Kalimantan just had such a passion to follow God and we just said wherever you want us to send us God whatever you want us to do that's what we'll do so a door opened up here in Borneo uh, even that we didn't even know where Borneo was we didn't know anything about the people but we just had all of a sudden realized that there was a, a whole different tribe and we fell in love with the people so we've been going to lots and lots of different tribes bringing the gospel message of love and salvation there and uh, then we just started to see all the different uh, situations that these people were living in. You know, every village had their own witch doctor who lorded over them, and you know they lived in constant fear. It was really awful to see uh, how their condition was. Often you walked into a village and you just sensed the evilness over the place. We started to see a lot of children who were neglected, who are not wanted. You know, they feel that they've never been wanted, and uh, some of their parents even told them they don't want them. And so they go through life like. Uh, feeling that nobody cares, nobody loves them. And so that's why we have Living Waters Village. So when we started, we had nothing. We had no money whatsoever. And now we have uh, more than 620 something kids. We have 80 buildings, schools uh, from primary school to secondary school. So wonderful to see, you know, what God can do if you just dare to step out in faith and believe that he can do anything. Saya Isra, saya umur 22 tahun, 16 tahun yang lalu saya ditemukan di hutan sendirian. Menderita karena tuberkulosis, saya bisa meninggal dalam seminggu. Tuhan sudah menyembuhkan kedua cacat fisik dan kerohanian saya. Sungai kehidupan adalah keluarga saya. Hari ini saya tinggal dengan anak-anak yang baru datang, membantu mereka merasa seperti di rumah. Halo, nama saya Sisi. Saya 17 tahun dan siswa SMA. Saya sudah 12 tahun tinggal di sini dan bertumbuh. Setiap pagi, saya dan teman-teman saya pergi ke sekolah dengan berjalan kaki. Saya senang menghabiskan waktu saya dengan sahabat saya Melina. Dan kesukaan saya adalah bahasa Inggris, tetapi di sekolah bisa menjadi sulit. Suatu hari saya berharap bisa membantu yang lain tahu cara mengasihi Kristus. Saya berasal dari Kampung Nonyan. Orang tua saya sudah meninggal dan paman saya menyuruh saya tidur di tempat ayam. Untungnya saya mampu bertahan dengan bantuan dari satu orang. Tidak ada yang peduli dengan saya dan saya tinggal sendirian. Aku putus asa untuk makan dan malnutrisi. Banyak anak-anak di tempat living water, Felix berasal dari masa lalu. Dan sebelumnya kami tidak tahu apa artinya komunitas. Ketika kami bertumbuh, kami belajar bertanggung jawab dan bekerja sama. Tempat ini adalah keluarga, 
kami melakukan segala sesuatu bersama-sama seperti saudara. Kami bekerja sama, kami masak bersama, kami belajar bersama, kami berdoa bersama, kami mendukung satu sama lain, kami melayani satu sama lain. Hidup dijalani bersama setiap hari, dan kami saling mengasihi satu sama lain. Tetapi, kadang-kadang hal-hal tidak selalu baik, tapi kami belajar untuk menyelesaikannya. Sebelum matahari terbit, kami datang bersama-sama ke doa pagi. Bertumbuh di dalam hubungan kami dengan Yesus, itu adalah bagian terbesar dari kehidupan di sini. Beriman Tuhan memberi hidup dan kita mengikutinya setiap hari. Menyanyikan pujian dan menyembah merupakan sebuah sukacita yang besar. Di tempat asal saya, sulit untuk tahu Tuhan. Sebagai anak, saya candu terhadap alkohol. Saya marah dan bertingkah di luar. Tapi Tuhan bisa mengubah hati. Ketika saya hilang, saya ditemukan. Di mana tidak ada kedamaian, saya menemukan kedamaian. Di mana tidak ada pengharapan, saya menemukan pengharapan. Di mana tidak ada sukacita, saya menemukan sukacita. Di mana tidak ada kasih, saya menemukan kasih. Ketika tidak ada rumah, saya menemukan rumah dengan Yesus. Living waters uh, for me is uh, it's family. Everyone who comes here in this village experience his love, his friendship. They're not strangers or um, visitors, but they're family. They're an older brother or a younger sister. It really is a place where our kids come in here and they haven't experienced love before. Can meet the heart of Jesus. No, it doesn't matter what uh, history you've had or past you've had or what baggage um, the kids are bringing in, they, they are embraced for who they are. Seeing them transformed in, in the times of being here, seeing them growing and just, just growing in life. Um, it's a place for kids to be able to be kids, to grow up, to have a family, have the education. Get a smile again, they have hope again, they start dreaming again. Where, um, Miracles happen when God's working here every day in each one of these kids' life, in each one of these adults' lives. A place where brokenness is transformed to hope. The Living Waters Village is a place where people can meet with Christ, where they're loved, where they're cared for, where they're nurtured, and where they're taught in the things of God. God just continues to mold them and that God does miracles in this place. Kids that have had cancer, if they've been healed of cancer, each one comes with a lot of baggage. And after being touched by God, now so changed and so loving and caring for one another. And uh, once they open up their hearts uh, to God and they receive Christ in their lives, to be able to share this love of God to their own people and uh, with others around them. So that's it. Oh, that's where we're going. And um, we're, you know, that, yeah, we're standing at the beginning in so many ways. So I'm sure we'll have stories to uh, tell once we're back. And lots of ways, like, so much of this is to be seen, what God's going to do you like in us and um, what we're going to get to see over there. But we're feeling really excited and expectant and just, yeah, wanted to share it with you guys. Yeah, for sure. And just like a last little note, just wanted to thank you guys for obviously taking the time to be here. Thank, thanks, Michael and Ellie, for give us the space to share and and for for the opportunity to journey together that's awesome thank you so we're, we're just going to pray for these guys so um, do the elders want to come up and um pray over these guys for me and you want to come up david where are you cool um just um uh, also I, I had the opportunity as well to have a coffee with um with phil and with ronnie uh, the next day, I think it was, or later on in the week, and um, 
Ronnie is the real deal, eh? Like, he's just such a good guy. You can just see the love of God oozing out of him. And um, it was really impacting for me just, just having that time with them as well. And so, um, you know, just the, they're going to a great place with great people. And so that's really exciting. So we're going to pray for these guys. So why don't we stand together um, and just uh, let, let's pray together. Father, we just thank you uh, for Aaron and Elodie. Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, that you have birthed something in them. Uh, e- even years ago, it was birthed in them, and we thank you that today we are we are a part of seeing that uh, coming to life. We are we are part of seeing uh, these guys being sent uh, to Borneo, and and we know that this is just the start of something significant for their future. Um, and, and so, Father, we we just come together as a church family, and we just want to bless them as they go. But for, Father, we we send them with our blessing. Father, although that it's just them going uh, this time, Father, we, we go with them in heart and in spirit. Father, our prayers go with them, our, our, our prayers of faith and our, our prayers of, um, of comfort and, and all of that, go, they, they go with them. And so, Father, we thank you uh, for that, and we just pray a blessing upon them. Uh, Father, we just pray that as they are there, uh, Lord, I pray that they would be undone in ways that they have never experienced before, Father, that, that they would experience your love, they would see your love in a way that they have never seen and experienced before, Father. They would see something uh, there that would just, Father, I pray it would wreck them for the rest of their life, Lord, that they would be undone for your kingdom. And so, Father, we thank you for what you're doing in their hearts right now as you're preparing them to go. And, and we just also, we just want to pray provision over them, Lord, that as they're there, there would be, there would be no lack, there would be uh, health, Father, we know they're going into a, a culture and a place that has all sorts of other uh, things going on. Father, we just pray for, for their health. Father, we pray that you would protect them. Protect them while they're there. And so, Father, we thank you for both of them. Bless them in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah, amen. Amen. Awesome. Bless you guys. Awesome. Hey, um, bless you. Um, so just one other thing uh, as, we, as we finish today. Uh, so they're going on Friday, eh? Friday, they're flying out. Uh, we do, do just want to say, if, if you feel on your heart this morning to support them um, financially or even to support um, Borneo Village, um, Living Waters Village in Borneo, um, uh, we can do that through, through the church. We can take donations and make sure that that gets to them and gets to um, the Living Waters Village in, in Borneo. And so if that is on your heart, um, even today, maybe just put on your Connect card uh, that you would like to do that and we'll get in touch with you. Um, or you can make a donation and just put uh, Borneo or Aaron and Elodie and we'll just make sure that that gets to them. We, we don't want to just send them with uh, thoughts and prayers, but also uh, you know, putting, putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak, and just saying, hey, we're with you as well. And so uh, if you feel that on your heart, I um, just encourage you to do that. Um, but uh, we, we're going to close uh, the service now. And so um, enjoy uh, uh, coffee. Uh, hang around, let's hang around and uh, have a good time together. But don't forget, next week we've got uh, Maidstone, uh, not Maidstone, uh, Mary Bank School. Maidstone's the one just around the corner from us. Uh, Mary Bank School uh, with us, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and it's going to be quite different. We'll probably have to set chairs up differently and have all the kids up the front, but it's going to be it's going to be a good time. So uh, look forward to that. See you next Sunday. Uh, bless your church.